Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from JNJ Global. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Silvio Danese, professor of gastroenterology at uh, San Raffaele Hospital in Milano, Italy. Welcome to this program entitled What's New in Biologic Therapies for Crohn's Disease? An update from Vienna. Joining me today is Bruce Sanz, Professor of Medicine and Chief of Dr. Annie Janowitz Division of Gastroenterology at Taikan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, US. Welcome. So today we will look together at what are the key clinical data for emerging biologics for Crohn's disease presented at ECHO. One of the very first studies that has been presented at uh, ECHO has been the Galaxy One study. Uh, as you know, um, the Galaxy is based on uh, Buzercoma, which is an IL-23 antagonist that is approved already for other indications such as uh, uh, severe plaque psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And uh, in uh, uh, Galaxy One, we have seen already the induction part in which Guzelcoma has been proven to be effective at week 12 for all the uh, key clinical and endoscopic outcomes. And uh, in the maintenance study, patients uh, were continued to receive either Guzelcoma by the dose of 200 or 100 or Ustekinumab as reference arm. And uh, multiple uh, endpoints were uh, assessed uh, for efficacy and of course also safety, including uh, uh, clinical remission, uh, steroid-free clinical remission, clinical response, PRO2 remission. When you look at all the different doses, um, Guzelcomab was able over time to build on efficacy, uh, achieving for uh, all the different doses uh, um, an effect size of around 65%. Please note that all the different doses and the different arms were not powered to find differences between the arms. And the same was for Ustekinumab that was used just as a reference arm. And of course, also steroid-free clinical remission was achieved in over 60% uh, of patients. That means that the majority of patients was in remission and without steroids, clinical response was achieved combined in all the groups in around 70%. And uh, I think that these data are very reassuring because uh, now phase three is ongoing and uh, hopefully we can see the final uh, data for the efficacy bars. Also adverse events were uh, uh, obviously recorded over the uh, 48 weeks of uh, treatment. And very importantly, there were no uh, serious infections or no major serious infections. There was uh, um, no uh, cases reported of uh, tuberculosis. So I think this was something uh, uh, very remarkable. So Bruce, this was uh, one IL-23 inhibitor, but there are many others uh, that are also in uh, late uh, stage development. What else did you see interesting at uh, ECHO? Yes, Silvio. So we're seeing a whole raft of different anti-IL-23 agents being looked at, both in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And we have more Crohn's disease data from the agent rizinkizumab. Um, rizinkizumab is an anti P19 antibody, uh, just like gaselkamab, and it's far along in, in the progress of its studies. And here we saw at uh, this year's ECHO some data, additional data from the advance and motivate studies, which were the induction studies and the fortify study, which was for maintenance. Um, so in these studies, uh, in this presentation, at least, we looked at the endoscopic data and had a comparison of the patients who were naive to biologics and the patients who were inadequate responders. So just to remind you, patients were randomized to get 
uh, intravenous rizinkizumab 600 milligrams or placebo intravenously every four weeks for 12 weeks in the advance and motivate induction phase. And then patients received either three, 360 milligrams subcutaneously of rizinkizumab or with, were withdrawn to receive placebo subcutaneously every eight weeks over 52 weeks of maintenance. And the outcomes that were looked at and presented here were the 12 week results and the week 52 results with regard to endoscopic outcomes like response, which is a decrease by 50% from baseline, endoscopic remission, ulcer free endoscopy, very rigorous and deep remission at week 52, which is both clinical remission by CDAI and endoscopic remission in the same patient, a very difficult outcome. And across the board, uh, with all of these outcomes, you could see that uh, they were achieved by rizinkizumab. And the most notable thing is you did not see very much difference in the treatment effect size, regardless of prior experience with biologic therapies. So I think this means that no matter what the bio experience of the patient, we can expect uh, rizinkizumab to be effective for these patients and highly effective at that. So excellent. I think that beside that rizinkizumab, there were also many other uh, uh, different drugs, new emerging treatments and, and advanced uh, um, treatments such as small molecules. Something that I really uh, liked uh, has been the report of filgotinib, um, selective JAK1 inhibitor for Crohn's disease. So this is uh, very interesting because not only for Crohn's disease, but it was reported the phase two divergence study in which patients with perianal fistulizing in Crohn's disease uh, have been randomized to receive uh, placebo or filgotinib at the two doses of 100 and 200. In this case, the primary endpoint was uh, combined fistula response meant as a reduction of at least one point from baseline in the number of draining external opening and no fluid collections above one centimeter. Uh, actually, these were all centrally red pelvic uh, MRI. And then also a key secondary endpoint was combined fistula remission, uh, meant as the closure of all draining external opening uh, present at baseline and no fluid collections above one centimeter at week 24. So when you look at the data, it's uh, uh, very impressive, the capability of uh, filgotinib 200 to achieve a delta of over 22% over placebo in uh, fistula response and almost half of the patients achieved uh, fistula remission. Uh, and this is a remarkable data because of course, uh, this is a big and med medical need considering that the majority of the patients uh, have been already received anti-TNF. So of course, this is a phase two, we need more data for the uh, phase three but this looks uh, very promising. So Bruce, you presented one of the top highlights. And uh, this is a new strategy, the VEGA study. Would you tell us what uh, happened? Why is so special this study? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so the VEGA study was actually an ulcerative colitis study, not a Crohn's disease study. But it, at the end, we'll talk about what the implications might be for Crohn's disease. And what's really revolutionary about this study is it is literally the first study in IBD to look at the combination of two biologic therapies uh, in one treatment arm uh, in a randomized controlled fashion. So the Vega study looked at patients who had moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis, and they were randomized one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to either get uh, golimumab, which is approved in the United States for the treatment of ulcerative colitis and is an anti-TNF antibody, or gaselkamab, which we heard already is an anti-IL-23 antibody, um, or to get the combination at the same doses combined uh, in, in the same patient. So these patients were given these treatments and looked out to week 12. The primary endpoint was clinical response. Um, by definition, these patients were naive to anti-TNF as well as to ustekinumab, which is, as you know, an anti-IL-12 and 23 antibody. Uh, there was a major secondary endpoint for clinical remission at week 12. And what was really quite remarkable of these results is that uh, in basically all of the outcomes that were looked at, um, the combination therapy results were superior 
to the either monotherapy result. And it was most impressive actually for the more uh, objective outcomes such as endoscopic improvement. There you saw rates approaching 50% for the combination arm, whereas for golimumab alone, it was 25%. For gesalcomab, 29.6%. Uh, Histologic remission also superior. So in a number of respects, the combination seems superior. And I think this has implications potentially for Crohn's disease as well, where we're looking for better ways to overcome the plateauing of efficacy that we're seeing with all our agents. Just one word on the safety, that would be a concern about combining two very active uh, anti-cytokine strategies. But in fact, at least over 12 weeks, we didn't see any, any emerging safety concerns. So I think this is really important for the field. Yeah, these are uh, truly excellent data because it's changing the strategy probably on how we are going to treat our patients. There was something else. Now we have presented new strategies, new drugs, but of course, also current approved biologics uh, have been uh, uh, reinforced with new data sets that have been released. One of these uh, has been uh, an academic study uh, coming from uh, France and from uh, GTED, which is called the SPER study, that tries to answer to a very key question, uh, what to do uh, in terms of uh, um, withdrawal of either infliximab or uh, anti-metabolites and uh, to see what happens to patients with Crohn's disease after we start the treatment. So what has been done uh, by Edouard Louis has been just to um, uh, randomized patients in uh, uh, combination treatment that were in steroid free remission for at least six months into three arms. One was continuing the combination, one was stopping infliximab, and one was stopping anti metabolite. And uh, the primary endpoints in this case were relapse rate and mean survival time spent in remission over two years. And what is uh, very interesting is that uh, infliximab withdrawal but not anti-metabolite withdrawal was associated with a significantly higher risk of uh, relapse than continuation of combination treatment. And also, there is something that is also reassuring, basically uh, all the patients in which infliximab was uh, stopped after reintroduction uh, of the treatment achieved a rapid remission. And uh, overall, what they conclude is that the time spent in remission over two years was similar across groups. So I would say that the data reinforce the concept that we should continue the treatment for our patients uh, overall. Bruce, there were also studies looking at uh, uh, comparative efficacy of biologics for endoscopy in Crohn's disease. Can you tell us uh, something uh, a little bit more about this? Yeah, one of the more interesting studies that was reported out was a pooled analysis of really patient-level data from a few hundred Crohn's disease patients across four clinical trial programs, uh, which looked at adalimumab, infliximab, ustekinumab, and vedolizumab. And here they were asking the question of uh, the efficacy of these agents with regard to endoscopic healing in the ileum as compared to the colon after one year of therapy. Again, these are all Crohn's disease patients in randomized controlled trials, and we're looking at one-year endoscopic healing outcomes, meaning an SCSCD of zero, really a rigorous outcome. And I think we all have this sense that many of our drugs are not um, as effective in the ileum as they are in colonic disease. And if you do, in fact, look at the comparative efficacy the agents that seem to do better in the ileum, uh, really at one year endoscopic healing, uh, really seem to be the anti-TNF agents uh, overall in the patients with ileal involvement. Um, if you're looking at biologic naive patients at one year, there you seem to see ustekinumab is doing about as well as the anti-TNF agents, adalimumab and infliximab, and vedolizumab is trailing behind. In the patients with colonic involvement, Again, you have the theme that adalimumab and infliximab do better. And so the, the authors concluded that anti-TNFs were generally superior to vedolizumab and ustekinumab for getting to endoscopic healing of the ileum and the colon, but the naive patients really could do well on ustekinumab as well in superior fashion to vedolizumab. I think this is important data 
as we choose agents uh, for our patients who have particularly ileal Crohn's disease. Very nice. I fully agree. There were also data related to strategy, once again, uh, in, the, in a subset uh, analysis, actually a follow-up analysis in, uh, uh, in the Stardust trial. As you know, standard, uh, Stardust is one of the very first three to target studies looking at, uh, um, at the uh, capabilities in two years of uh, the comparison between three to target versus standard of care in modifying the disease course in Crohn's disease. And what uh, Laurent Perimbiro has uh, done is to be uh, measuring Crohn's disease-related surgeries, hospitalization, the combination of the two, bowel damage or uh, disease-modifying events. And actually, uh, when you look at the overall capabilities of uh, treat to target around half of the events well, were reduced over time. So this is uh, actually very interesting. In addition to that, uh, always Loren has focused on perianal fistula closure in a combination analysis from both uh, CVU and uh, Stardust. And once again, this is looking at uh, uh, Ustekinumab and also Adalimumab, but particularly also correlating the efficacy of the drugs with uh, drug trough levels. Now, remember that these were very early patients. So the events of patients with perianal disease were very little. It was uh, uh, in the range of less than 20 patients per uh, treatment and per study. But uh, what is, uh, of course, uh, uh, remarkable is the capability of uh, both drugs in achieving uh, fistula closure, as we know in our clinical practice, but there was uh, not so much correlation between the trough levels and the uh, uh, drug concentration. So these, of course, uh, uh, data uh, have to be interpreted with caution because the, uh, the patient number were uh, very little. So I think that, uh, Bruce, uh, there are uh, many highlights and the future for our patients is very bright because we have uh, at least evidence in echo of new treatment strategies and also a lot of new drugs that will help us in uh, different clinical settings. What do you think? I, I completely agree. And it's great to see the anti-IL-23s coming along so nicely in Crohn's disease, also parenthetically in ulcerative colitis. It's great to see new strategies like combining two agents together that are biologics and getting better results potentially, and to see the small molecules coming along as well, even for tough patients like fistulizing Crohn's disease patients. So a lot of important evidence presented at ECHO this year. So Bruce, thank you very much for this very nice discussion. I would like to thank the audience and thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.